Explaining the Industrial Revolution. The global context for this epical economic transformation lies in a very substantial increase in human numbers from about 375 million people in 1400 to about 1 billion in the early 19th century. Accompanying this growth in population was an emerging energy crisis, most pronounced in Western Europe, China, and Japan, as wood and charcoal, the major industrial fuels, became scarcer and their prices rose. In short, global energy demands began to push against the existing local and regional ecological limits. In broad terms, the Industrial Revolution marks a human response to that dilemma as non-renewable fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas replace the endlessly renewable energy sources of wind, water, wood, and the muscle power of people and animals. It was a breakthrough of unprecedented proportions that made available for human use, at least temporarily, immensely greater quantities of energy. Sustaining the Industrial Revolution was another breakthrough, which lay in the exploitation of guano, or seabird excrement, from the islands off the coast of Peru, as well as various mineral sources of nitrates and phosphates in South America and Pacific Oceania. This was an agricultural breakthrough, as these substances, substances made excellent fertilizers, enriching the soils and enabling highly productive input-intensive farming. In much of Western Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, they sustained the production of food to feed both the draft animals and the growing human populations of the industrializing world. All of this wrought, of course, a mounting impact on the environment. The massive extraction of non-renewable raw materials to feed and to fuel industrial machinery coal, iron ore, petroleum, guano, and much more, altered the landscape in many places. Sewers and industrial waste emptied into rivers, turning them into poisonous cesspools. In 1858, the Thames River, running through London, London smelled so bad that the British House of Commons had to suspend its, its session. Smoke from coal-fired industries and domestic use polluted the air in urban areas and sharply increased the incidence of respiratory illness. Against these conditions, a number of individuals and small groups raised their voices. Romantic poets such as William Blake and William Wordsworth invade against the dark and satanic mills of industrial England and nostalgically urged a return to the green and pleasant land of an earlier time. Here were early and local signs of what became by the late 20th century an issue of unprecedented and global proportions. For many historians, the Industrial Revolution marked an era in both human history and the history of the planet that scientists increasingly call the Anthropocene, or the Age of Man. More and more, human industrial activity left a mark not only on human society, but also on the ecological, atmospheric, and geological history of the Earth. More immediately and more obviously, however, access to huge new sources of energy gave rise to an enormously increased output of goods and services. In Britain, where the Industrial Revolution began, industrial output increased some 50-fold between 1750 and 1900. It was a wholly unprecedented and previously unimaginable jump in the capacity of human societies to produce wealth. Lying behind it was a great acceleration in the rate of technological innovation, not simply this or that invention, the spinning jenny, power loom, steam engine, or cotton gin, but a culture of innovation, a widespread and almost obsessive belief that things could be endlessly improved. Early signs of the technological creativity that spanned the Industrial Revolution appeared in 18th century Britain, where a variety of innovations transformed cotton textile production. It was only in the 19th century, though, that Europeans in general, and the British in particular, were more clearly forged ahead of the rest of the world. The great breakthrough was the coal-fired steam engine, which provided an inanimate and almost limitless source of power beyond that of wind, water, or muscle and could be used to drive any number of machines, as well as locomotives and ocean-going ships. Soon the Industrial Revolution spread beyond the textile industry to iron and steel production, railroads and steamships, food processing and construction. Later in the 19th century, a so-called Second Industrial Revolution focused on chemicals, electricity, precision machinery, the telegraph and telephone, rubber, printing, and much more. Agriculture too was affected as mechanical reapers, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and refrigeration transformed this most ancient of industries. Technical innovation occurred in more modest ways as well. Patents for horseshoes in the United States, for example, grew from fewer than five per year before 1840 to 30 to 40 per year by the end of the century. Furthermore, industrialization soon spread beyond Britain to continental Western Europe and then in the second half of the century 
to the United States, Russia, and Japan. In the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution became global as a number of Asian, African, and Latin American countries developed substantial industrial sectors. Oil, natural gas, and nuclear reactions joined coal as widely available sources of energy, and new industries emerged in automobiles, airplanes, consumer durable goods, electronics, computers, and on and on. It was a cumulative process that, despite periodic ups and downs, accelerated over time. More than anything else, this continuous emergence of new techniques of production, together with the massive economic growth they made possible and the environmental impact they generated, marks the past 250 years as a distinct phase of human history. Why Europe? The Industrial Revolution has long been a source of great controversy among scholars. Why did it occur first in Europe? Within Europe, why did it occur earliest in Great Britain? And why did it take place in the late 18th and 19th centuries? Some explanations have sought the answer in unique and deeply rooted features of European society, history, or culture. One recent account, for example, argued that Europeans have been distinguished for several thousand years by a restless, creative, and freedom-loving culture, with its roots in the aristocratic warlike societies of early Indo-European invaders. While not denying certain distinctive qualities of the West, many world historians have challenged views that seem to suggest that Europe alone was destined to lead the way to modern economic life. Such an approach, they argue, not only is Eurocentric and deterministic, but also flies in the face of much recent research. Historians now know that other areas of the world had experienced times of great technological and scientific flourishing. Between 750 and 1100 CE, the Islamic world generated major advances in shipbuilding, the use of tides and falling water to generate power, paper making, textile production, chemical technologies, water mills, clocks, and much more. India had long been the world center of cotton textile production, the first place to turn sugarcane juice into crystallized sugar, and the source of many agricultural innovations and mathematical inventions. To the Arabs of the 9th century CE, India was a place of marvels, more than either of these, China was clearly the world leader in technological innovation between 700 and 1400 CE, prompting various scholars to suggest that China was on the edge of an industrial revolution by 1200 or so. For reasons much debated among historians, all of these flowerings of technological creativity had slowed down considerably or stagnated by the early modern era, when the pace of technological change in Europe began to pick up. But these earlier achievements certainly suggests that Europe was not alone in its capacity for technological innovation, nor did Europe enjoy any overall economic advantage as late as 1750. Over the past several decades, historians have carefully examined the economic conditions of various Eurasian societies in the 18th century and found a world of surprising resemblances. Economic indicators such as life expectancies, patterns of consumption and nutrition, wage levels, general living standards, widespread free markets, and prosperous merchant communities suggest broadly similar conditions across the major civilizations of Europe and Asia. Thus, Europe had no obvious economic lead, even on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. Rather, according to one leading scholar, there existed something of a global economic parity between the most advanced regions in the world economy. A final reason for doubting a unique European capacity for industrial development lies in the relatively rapid spread of industrial techniques to many parts of the world over the past 250 years, a fairly short time by world history standards. Although the process has been highly uneven, industrialization has taken root to one degree or another in Japan, China, India, Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, Indonesia, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, South Korea, and elsewhere. Such a pattern weakens any suggestion that European culture or society was exceptionally compatible with industrial development. Thus, while sharp debate continues, many contemporary historians are inclined to see the Industrial Revolution erupting rather quickly and quite unexpectedly between 1750 and 1850. Two interesting factors help explain why this process occurred in Europe rather than elsewhere. One lies in certain patterns of Europe's internal development that favored innovation. Its many small and highly competitive states taking shape in the 12th or 13th centuries, arguably provided an insurance against economic and technological stagnation, which the larger Chinese, Ottoman, or Mughal empires perhaps lacked. If so, then Western Europe's failure to recreate the earlier unity of the Roman Empire 
may have acted as a stimulus to innovation. Furthermore, the relative newness of these European states and their monarch's desperate need for revenue in the absence of an effective tax-collecting bureaucracy pushed European royals into an unusual alliance with their merchant classes. Small groups of merchant capitalists might be granted special privileges, monopolies, or even tax-collecting responsibilities in exchange for much-needed loans or payments to the state. It was therefore in the interest of governments to actively encourage commerce and innovation. Thus, states granted charters and monopolies to private trading companies, and governments founded scientific societies and offered prizes to promote innovation. In this way, European merchants and other innovators from the 15th century onward gained an unusual degree of freedom from state control, and in some places, a higher social status than their counterparts in more established civilizations. In Venice and Holland, merchants actually controlled the state. By the 18th century, major Western European societies were highly commercialized and governed by states generally supportive of private commerce. In short, they were well on their way toward capitalist economies, where buying and selling on the market was a widely established practice before they experienced industrialization. Such internally competitive economies, coupled with a highly competitive system of rival states, arguably fostered innovation in the new civilization taking shape in Western Europe. Europe's societies, of course, were not alone in developing market-based economies by the 18th century. Japan, India, and especially China were likewise highly commercialized or market-driven. However, in the several centuries after 1500, Western Europe was unique in a second way. That region alone found itself at the hub of the largest and most varied networks of exchange in history. Widespread contact with culturally different peoples was yet another factor that historically has generated extensive exchange and innovation. This new global network, largely the creation of Europeans themselves, greatly energized commerce and brought Europeans into direct contact with people around the world. For example, Asia, home to the world's richest and most sophisticated societies, was the initial destination of European voyages of exploration. The German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz encouraged Jesuit missionaries in China not to worry so much about getting things European to the Chinese, but rather about getting remarkable Chinese inventions to us. Inexpensive and well-made Indian textiles began to flood into Europe, causing one English observer to note, almost everything that used to be made of wool or silk, relating either to dress of the women or the furniture of our houses, was supplied by the Indian trade. The competitive stimulus of these Indian cotton textiles was certainly one factor driving innovation in the British textile industry. Likewise, the popularity of Chinese porcelain and Japanese lacquerware prompted innovation and imitation in England, France, and Holland. Thus, competition from desirable high quality and newly available Asian goods played a role in stimulating Europe's industrial revolution. In the Americas, Europeans found a windfall of silver that allowed them to operate in Asian markets. They also found timber, fish, maize, potatoes, and much else to sustain a growing population. Later, slave-produced cotton supplied an emerging textile industry with its key raw material at low prices, while sugar, similarly produced with slave labor, furnished cheap calories to European workers. Europe's Industrial Revolution, included Peter Stern, historian Peter Stearns, stemmed in great part from Europe's ability to draw disproportionately on world resources. The new societies of the Americas further offered a growing market for European machine-produced goods and generated substantial profits for European merchants and entrepreneurs. None of the other empires of the early modern era enriched their imperial heartland so greatly or provided such a spur to technological and economic growth. Thus, the intersection of new, highly commercialized, competitive European societies with the novel global network of their own making provides a context for understanding Europe's industrial revolution. Commerce and cross-cultural exchange, acting in tandem, sustain the impressive technological changes of the first industrial societies. Why Britain? If the Industrial Revolution was initially a Western European phenomenon, generally, it clearly began in Britain in particular. The world's first Industrial Revolution unfolded spontaneously in a country that concentrated some of the more general features of European society. It was both unplanned and unexpected. With substantial imperial possessions in the Caribbean, in North America, and by the late 18th century in India as well, Britain was the most highly commercialized of Europe's larger countries. Its landlords had long ago enclosed much agricultural land, 
pushing up the small farmers and producing for the market. A series of agricultural innovations, crop rotation, selective breeding of animals, lighter plows, higher yielding seeds, increased agricultural output, kept food prices low, and freed up labor from the countryside. The guilds, which earlier had protected Britain's urban artisans, had largely disappeared by the 18th century, allowing employers to run their manufacturing enterprises as they saw fit. Coupled with a rapidly growing population, these processes ensured a ready supply of industrial workers who had few alternatives available to them. Furthermore, British aristocrats, unlike their counterparts in Europe, had long been interested in the world of business, and some took part in new mining and manufacturing enterprises. British commerce, moreover, extended around the world, its large merchant fleet protected by the Royal Navy. The wealth of empire and global commerce, however, were not themselves sufficient for spawning the Industrial Revolution, for Spain, the earliest beneficiary of the American wealth, was one of the slowest industrializing European countries into the 20th century. British political life encouraged commercialization and economic innovation. Its policy of religious toleration, formally established in 1688, welcomed people with technical skills regardless of their faith, whereas France's persecution of its Protestant minority had chased out some of its most skilled workers. The British government favored men of business with tariffs that kept out cheap Indian textiles, with laws that made it easy to form companies and to forbid workers' unions, with roads and canals that helped create a unified internal market, and with patent laws that served to protect the interests of inventors. Checks on royal prerogative, trial by jury, and the growing authority of Parliament, for example, provided a freer arena for private enterprise than elsewhere in Europe. Europe's scientific revolution also took a distinctive form in Great Britain, in ways that fostered technological innovation. Whereas science in continental Europe was largely based on logic, deduction, and mathematical reasoning, in Britain, it was much more concerned with observation, experiment, precise measurements, mechanical devices, and practical commercial applications. This kind of science played a role in the invention and improvement of the steam engine. Even though most inventors were artisans or craftsmen, rather than scientists, in 18th century Britain, they were in close contact with scientists, makers of scientific instruments, and entrepreneurs, whereas in continental Europe, these groups were largely separate. The British Royal Society, an association of natural philosophers, or scientists, established in 1660, saw its role as promoting useful knowledge. To this end, it established mechanics libraries, published broadsheets and pamphlets on recent scientific advances, and held frequent public lectures and demonstrations. The integration of science and technological technology became widespread and permanent after 1850, but for a century before, it was largely a British phenomenon. Finally, several accidents of geography and history contributed something to Britain's Industrial Revolution. The country had a ready supply of coal and iron ore, often located close to each other and within easy reach of major industrial centers. Although Britain took part in the wars against Napoleon, the country's island location protected it from the kind of invasion that so many continental European states experienced during the era of the French Revolution. Moreover, Britain's relatively fluid society allowed for adjustments in the face of social changes without widespread revolution. By the time it dust settled from the immense disturbances of the French Revolution, Britain was well on its way to becoming the world's first industrial society.